Good morning. Um, the ground rules are that this is the president will be on the record. Uh, he'll be followed by, uh, he'll have a brief opening remarks and then he'll take questions. He'll be followed by Admiral Poindexter, who will be on background, who will be followed by the Chief of Staff, uh, Don Regan, who will also be on background. We will have uh, transcripts available of all three speakers at 5 o'clock in room 45. And uh, this is all for release by 6 p.m. tonight. President? Yes, sit down. <laughs> I mentioned to the staff a few weeks ago the phrase that would be a good pivot for the United Nations speech, one that said simply, nations don't mistrust each other because they're armed, they're armed because they mistrust each other. And I bring this up now because I think the current summit and the pre-summit discussions are different in kind from those of past decades. To begin with, the strategic picture has changed markedly. America's economy and military power are resurgent, the Western democracies are revitalized and ideas like democratic self-determination and the free market are influencing decisions even in Marxist nations. But above all, the negotiating is being done above in an atmosphere of candor and realism. We've repeated in public our views of Soviet intentions. So too they know we're not lessening our commitment uh, to the struggle for freedom in regional conflicts in Africa, Central America, Afghanistan, and Kampuchea. And finally, the Soviets understand the agenda is not one-sided. What we want discussed is not only on the table, but must be part of the basis for any future agreements. And these are hopeful developments, and that's why I think we can view this whole summit process soberly, and yet with a reasonable degree of optimism. We want progress with the Soviets, on strategic deterrence, human rights, regional conflicts, and bilateral relations. But we will not sacrifice our principles, values, or interests just to obtain agreements. We did not do so in Geneva, and we will not do so at Reykjavik or Washington. On this, the American people, I think, will support us. You and I know that, and I think the Soviets do too. That's one reason the last summit succeeded in being more than a media event. I believe the next one can do likewise. And this is why the Reykjavik talks are not a substitute for Mr. Gorbachev's visit here. They're an informal session to make concrete preparations, preparations I felt could be important for the summit. Iceland is the final base camp before the summit. The atmosphere surrounding our discussions must be realistic because I believe only such an atmosphere can make for useful negotiations with the Soviets. So it's true the Danilov affair had to be resolved before we could move forward. But it's also true that we've seen from the Soviet side some positive signs and some definite movement. We hope it continues. And that's why I'm meeting Mr. Gorbachev in Iceland. That's also why in its closing days, Congress must act responsibly it must not tie my hands in these crucial discussions, and it must not undercut our negotiating position. I know the American people are united in their support of our efforts. And we need the same support from the Congress. <clears throat> now, I'll take your questions. Yeah. What are the positive signs in the definite movement that you've seen from the Soviets? The positive side to the... You said there have been positive signs and definite movement on the part of the Soviets. Oh, well, I think, what have, what have well, well, I think they've been amazing, and they've been since this man came into, into power there, and that is, he is the first, to my knowledge and my memory, the first Russian leader that has ever proposed actually eliminating weapons. There have been 19 attempts by this country to get some agreement with the Soviets regarding uh, mainly nuclear weapons since World War II. Uh, None of those meetings came about or nothing was ever accomplished. And then when we did have some meetings, those meetings only talked about limiting and regulating the increase in weapons. But here we have had actual proposals by the general secretary to reduce the number of weapons on both sides and even expressed a desire to see the elimination of uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. So this is a change. Yeah. Mr. President, uh, 
We have been told that the KGB paid a heavy price for their arrest of Danilov uh, through the expulsion of many of their people in New York, uh, including their uh, uh, espionage network, their station chief, deputy chief, the people that ran Gennady Zakharov. Uh, and yet today the Soviets have said that, uh, uh, that they're not being expelled, that the 25 uh, uh, do, do not have to go home and have not gone home. Uh, can you uh, can you clarify that situation uh, uh, for us? And, and let, let me ask you, if I can, one other very quick question, which I've been asked to ask you. Uh, you're quoted today in the Washington Post as having uh, said at a meeting on August 14th that Gaddafi should go to San Francisco. Uh, one of the papers I write for is in San Francisco, and they take that as a, uh, a bit of a slur and uh, wonder uh, the, the implication being that that uh, nuts like Gaddafi should go to San Francisco because that's where uh, a lot of nuts live. And uh, uh, I wondered if you wanted to say Well, I challenge the veracity of that entire story that I, I read this morning uh, with great shock. And uh, sometimes I understand your sacred policy of never relieve, re revealing sources, but do you really have to defend sources that misinform you? So, uh, <clears throat> now, wait a minute, before you got to that, what was your... Oh, the 25. More than half, according to the figures I have, have gone home. We have granted them until October 14th on others that they presented a case that there was hardship, uh, difficulty in them with families and all and uh, uh, being able to move, but the 25 will go by October 14th. Mr. President, to follow up on your comment about the story in the Post this morning, there is a memo quoted there that, that says that, the, that there, was no, there is not evidence of uh, Gaddafi's uh, planning any, uh, any operations, that he seems to be quiescent, yet the press was told at the time that, uh, that he apparently was planning new activities. Now, was, did the White House disinform the press or did it not in this, in this instance? Well, we have been, we've been keeping track, of course, as well as we can with regard to intelligence information as to whether or not he is he's planning additional moves or terrorist acts and so forth and uh, so yes there are memos back and forth about that and what the what the information is and uh, so when I challenge the veracity of that uh, that whole story I I can't deny that here and there they're going to have something to hang it on well, in what way do you challenge the veracity of it well <clears throat> I don't want Gaddafi any place in the United States. And being a Californian, it's the last place I'd send him. Well, Mr. President, uh, just, to, just to follow up on this, the, burden, the main burden of the story suggests that your White House, specifically your national security advisor, constructed an operation whereby the free press in this country was going to be used to convey a false story to the world, namely that, that Gaddafi was, was planning new terrorist operations and that we were going to hit him again, or we might hit him again, no, full well knowing that this was not true. Now, if that's the case, then the press is being used, and we, and we will in the future not know when we're being told information from the White House, whether it's true or it's not. Well, any time you get any of those leaks, uh, Morton, call me. <laughs> uh, I'll be happy to tell you which ones are honest or not. But uh, no, our position, uh, this was wrong and false. Our position has been one of which after we took the action we felt we had to take, and I still believe was the correct thing to do, our position has been one in which we would just as soon have Mr. Gaddafi go to bed every night wondering what we might do. And uh, I think that's the best, the best position for anyone like that to be in. Certainly, we did not intend any program in which we were going to suggest or encourage him uh, to uh, do more things uh, or more terrorist, uh, con conduct more terrorist attacks, we would hope that the one thing that we have done uh, will have uh, turned him off on that. Well, good. You, did you have your hand up? You, you. On that subject, this was another one, Mr. President. Uh, when you left Geneva last November, there was at least a hint from the White House that uh, you felt you'd established uh, reasonably good relationship with Mr. Gorbachev. Since that time, there have been several sharp exchanges and disagreements, including the Danilov affair. Do you anticipate you can go back, sit down with him, and resume where you were before in Geneva? Is it, 
Yes, I think we, I think we can. Uh, um, I think we got pretty well acquainted back there, and I, I don't think, on the other hand, that I'm going to be snowed into believing that the leopard is changing his spots. I think he is dedicated to their form of government. I think he believes much of the propaganda about us. After all, he's a young man. He's grown up in that, that society. But at the same time, uh, I think in the private conversations that we had, uh, uh, there was a certain frankness that I have never felt in any of the other leaders from the Soviet Union that I have met with. And uh, he made this proposal about the meeting in Iceland. And uh, our position was uh, there would be no answer from us about that until Danilov was freed. And once that was done, uh, yes, and we, pr we proposed the date then that would be convenient for us. And so we're, we're going there. As you know, uh, Mr. President, some of your staunchest supporters feel that the arrangements for the release of Danilov and the arrangements for the pre-summit meeting in Iceland are not really in the best interest of the United States. And they have questioned those arrangements, and in effect, they, they've suggested that you've gone soft on the Soviets. How would you respond to their criticism? It'll be a cold day in Hades when I go soft on communism. I was blooded a long time ago in that battle, and I have never changed my view of them. On the other hand, as I said to him in our meeting in Geneva, he and I are uniquely in a position today where we could bring about World War III, or we're also in a position that we could bring about a peace in the world. And I made it plain then that uh, we don't like their system. We know they don't like ours. But we have to live in the world together. And it's, we're both going to be better off if we can live in the world of peace. So I'm not going to give away the store just to get an agreement on paper. But since he has brought up the subject of the reduction and even elimination of intercontinental nuclear weapons, uh, yes, I think that. Uh, this is an opportunity that shouldn't be lost. Jack? Mr. President, on a different topic, yesterday Mr. Bota advised the Senate that he would stop the sale of uh, South African grain. Do you think his statement has helped or hurt uh, the cause? I think it hurt because I think it challenged some senators that thought this was improper, and uh, they're more resistant to my pleas than they might have been. Can I, yeah, can I go back to Morton's question a minute ago? You seem to, you've left the impression, I think, that you think it is all right to put out false information to the press in order to make Gaddafi nervous. Oh, no. Is, no. That, is that not accurate? Oh, no, no. Was I, the information that was put out false or was it, it uh, accurate? I used this same term once when there used to be arguments, and I wasn't in this office at the time, uh, in another office, there used to be arguments about nuclear weapons uh, in Vietnam during that conflict. And I said at the time that, well, we knew that we were never going to use nuclear weapons there. We should never say that. We should just let them go to bed every night wondering whether we might use those weapons. Well, the same thing is, is uh, true with someone like Gaddafi and with all the speculation that was going on and the media throughout the world about whether our action would tempt him into further acts or not. Uh, and constantly there were questions or, uh, aimed at me as to uh, were we planning anything else. My feeling was I wouldn't answer those questions. My feeling was just the same thing. He should go to bed every night wondering what we might do. But in this case, apparently there were memos which said there was a deliberate attempt to mislead the press and the American people. Those I challenge. They were not a part of any meeting I've ever attended. That, that was my question, Mr. President. This Woodward story is based on an alleged memorandum from your national security advisor with lengthy quotes. Are those quotes accurate, and does this memorandum exist? Not things of that kind that was just that you just asked about. No, this was not any any plan of ours. But uh, I've come to the conclusion that Mr. Woodward is probably deep throat. All right. 
sorry, I couldn't stand here. Point extra. Oh. This this part is on background now. The other was on the record. The first thing I want to do, I've I've reviewed uh, our activity uh, on the Danilov case, Iceland. That have taken place over the past uh, two or three weeks. I thought the most useful thing first. I, I've I've made some uh, some points here. They're all rather. Uh, the brief points, but I think it's important to go through them, and I think many of them may take care of uh, of uh, questions that you may have, and then I'll take some questions. First, uh, 